welcome to Chats from the Wine Cellar. I'm Eula Georgieva, and this is the official inventory podcast. I am very excited to have our friend Charles Curtis, Master of Wine, back in the hot seat, this time to talk about champagne. Charles, welcome back. Thanks so much. Thanks for having me. It's great to be here and to talk about champagne, of course. One of your many passions. I know last time we did auctions, so it's nice to actually delve into a bit of a region. So let's dive right in and you sure. tell us how you got into champagne, what your connection to the region is. Ah, I got in many, many years ago. Um, and from as long as I can remember, before I was of legal drinking age, I loved champagne. There was It, it goes way, way back with me. But I think what really kicked it off for me was uh, a field trip for school. I was uh, studying at the Cordon Bleu in Paris. And they took us to Champagne for the day, and we visited a couple properties. And uh, I remember being just totally blown away with the whole experience, like everybody we met, all the wine. That was in 1990. And then I went back several times in the 90s. I was By that time, I had gotten, I was no longer a chef, and I was working in the wholesale wine trade. And I, got, I went back uh, working for a couple importers. And then in 2001... I left that aspect of the industry and started working for Moet Hennessy. And as you probably know, they own five champagne houses. And so from that time, I was going to Champagne easily four or five times a year, every year, I'm taking groups of salespeople, journalists, uh, all sorts of people. So I, I, I think I know the region really well. With that and Burgundy are the two regions I know the best. And I go back several times a year. I'm still going four or five times a year and uh, and I just love champagne. Can't drink enough of it. For those who don't know, can you explain where it is? Sure. Champagne, it's important to emphasize that champagne is a place before it's anything else. It's a place in France. It's just shy of 35,000 hectares, which is about 80,000 acres. It's east and slightly north of Paris. It's uh, sort of in between the Ardennes, which is the forest uh, on the border with uh, Germany and uh, Belgium and uh, Paris. It's in a region called the Paris Basin. The Paris Basin is a large deposit of chalk, which in uh, uh, some places can be, it can go down into the earth as much as uh, 300 meters. So it was deposited during the Jurassic period and uh, the chalk eventually got to be so heavy that it caused the crust of the earth literally to down warp. And so it's a, it's a, that's why it's called the Paris Basin. It's a, uh, it's a depression in the earth's crust that's just sort of like filled in with chalk. And the chalk makes the perfect uh, terroir for growing champagne because it holds enough water without uh, holding too much. So it drains, but it holds enough water so that the vines can can be nourished, it gives the vines the nutrients that they need, and the chalk is really is one key to champagne. And it's uh, there's a few other regions where they have chalk, like Jerez in Spain has a lot of chalk, um, but it's really relatively rare, especially to have it at, at that depth, and uh, that's one of the keys. Another key to champagne, what really sets it apart, is the fact that it's uh, cold, it's it's at the northern limit of where you can actually grow wine grapes. They always say, if you take your WSET classes, that you can't grow grapes north of 50 degrees north latitude. And Champagne is at 49.5 degrees north latitude. It's like right there at the limit. And uh, it's kind of an interesting thing because the, so they've been making wine in Champagne for, you know, literally for 2000 years. And, and for most of that time, the wine was really terrible. I mean, it was, it was awful because it was thin, it lacked strength and power and flavor, and it was it was weak and it was highly acidic. And uh, it must have been really revolting. I think now in the time of global warming, the the regular wine that you make in Champagne is is uh, getting better, you know, almost every year, almost noticeably from year to year, it's getting better. But before they figured out how to put the bubbles in, the stuff was really pretty nasty. And the the uh, the secret of champagne, the secret of sparkling champagne is this, that it had to be sort of substandard wine 
which was brought up to a level of excellence by this method, the champagne method that we'll, I'm assuming we'll talk about it in just a minute. And that's essentially is a method of enrichment. So you enrich it just enough. And if you started out with something that was tasty on its own and enriched it, then it would be too rich. It would be heavy. It would be cloying. It wouldn't be good. But in champagne, it's a super marginal climate and it just barely ripens it enough so that by the time you do this enrichment, it's absolutely perfect. So it's the cool climate, it's the chalky soils, and then it's the slope of the Paris basin itself, the hills that face east and sometimes south and uh, let it catch the rays of the sun so that really what happens is you get enough expression of the fruit from the grapes without having a high level of alcohol. Even today, even during global warming, it's relatively rare that the grapes ripen to more than 10.5% potential alcohol. So most wine, we used to think of wine as like 12.5 was kind of standard. Now, if you even in Burgundy, like 13.5 is standard in California, 14.5, 15 even is very, very common. And in some places, regular still wine can be 15, 16%, you know, but in Champagne, they struggle to get to 10 and a half. And that's, that's really the secret of it. And at 10 and a half, it has a beautiful expression of the fruit, which, you know, gives it the aroma and the flavor without being too heavy. And, and it retains enough acidity that, that can balance up the richness of the Champagne method. So many factors coming together, the chalk, the slope, the climate to make champagne so special. So it does give you an idea of just how rare this, this area is. But can you give us a sense of what does it feel like when you're there, right? Because there are a few little towns, or I don't know how big Epernay and Rem are. You've, you've been there. I've never been there, but I don't know how big they are. So uh, there are some towns there, but when you're going to the vineyard- You've never been there. I'm telling you, you have to stop what you're doing right now and get on a plane and go there because it is the, the most- visitable French wine region. I think it is because everyone goes to Paris, like probably 99 out of 100 people when they're going to France, they're going to Paris. But you can be in Champagne, in the center of Champagne in 38 minutes if you take the TGV from the center of Paris. So it's like a day. That's very precise. <laughs> You've taken yeah. this frame. <laughs> many times, many, many times. You have to get the right one because some are 41 minutes. You don't want that one. You want 37 oh, minutes. And... Uh, often what I do now is I don't go to Paris. I usually don't go to Paris without my wife because I'll just spend money that I don't need to spend. And unless she's with me, it's kind of a waste. I usually rent a car and go straight to Paris. If you do that, you're in for about a 90 minute car ride from the airport by the time you deal with traffic and everything. But it's very, very doable. It's closer than Burgundy. It's closer than any other region. And it's really great. So you've got Reims, which is spelled R-E-I-M-S. Um, a lot of times if French people are speaking to uh, an English speaker, they'll say Reims. But uh, the way French people say it is Reims. And you'll see that I usually use French pronunciation just because I think it's a French thing. So I should say it the way French people say it. For example, the producer of Comte de Champagne is Tatanger. Uh, which is how French people would say it. Um, most Americans would say Tattinger, and you can keep saying Tattinger. The Brits would say the same thing. But it's actually, it's a it's a German name, so they would say Tattinger or, or Bollinger. 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 Right, exactly. Yeah, so I, so I always use the French pronunciation. So anyhow, you've got Reims, which is, which is a big city. It's got over 100,000 people. I would say not a big city. It's it's nowhere near as big, for example, as Bordeaux or Nice or Lyon, but it's it's much bigger than Bonn, for example, in Burgundy or Tours in the Loire Valley. So it's a pretty decent sized city, and there's loads to see because it was invaded by Julius Caesar and the Romans in the first uh, first uh, couple decades of the of the Common Era. And they've still got plenty of Roman ruins. They have this really great arch from the third century. They have in the middle of town, there's all this stuff to see from Gallo-Roman times. But then there's the cathedral, which is worth a visit by its, even if you didn't drink wine at all, it'd be worth it to go see this cathedral. It's, it's one of the most 
amazingly perfect Gothic cathedrals in the world. It's been a UNESCO World Heritage Site forever. So there's loads of reasons to go to Champagne. Then, of course, unfortunately, um, it was it was almost completely destroyed in World War One, and it was rebuilt. And then they rebuilt it, uh, and they put up a lot of old uh, the. Uh, I think Art Deco buildings, there's, it's a treasure trove of like Art Deco architecture and, and there's like really great restaurants. And so that's kind of the center, administrative center of Champagne. It's like the capital of Champagne. It's the seat of government for the region is there. But really the winemaking capital is Epernay. That's where the CIBC is based. And uh, that's where... Uh, Moet de Chandon is based, which is still the largest producer of champagne in the world. And, and there's, so there's a lot of, and that's sort of, Epernay is kind of closer to the vineyards. And uh, to get to the vineyards from Reims, you had to get out of town, you get on the highway, you drive several exits, and then it's a bit of a schlep. But, but in Epernay, you go outside of the town of Epernay and boom, and inside of, there's actually vineyards in the, city center of Epernay. There's vineyards in the city center of Laos too, but anyhow. So then those are the two main towns. Then there's Chalon en Champagne, which is a, a bigger town, but it doesn't have any vineyards. And then there are, uh, at present at least, 319 villages that range in size from like less than 500 inhabitants to like 2,000 inhabitants. So little town, little villages, a lot of them are unremarkable. Some of them are scenic and uh, some are slightly bigger, like Ai, which is the one that's spelled A-Y with loud over the Y. So Ai is like slightly bigger. Um, anyhow, it's, it's a nice region to visit. So essentially, there are four main sub-regions in Champagne. There's what's called the Montagne de Reims, the Côte de Blanc, the Vallée de la Marne, and the Côte de Bar. So Montaigne de Reims is the one that everybody thinks of because it's closest to the city of Reims. It's the largest. There's the most villages there. It's called a mountain, but it's not really a mountain. It's uh, it's like 320 meters tall. Is that the slope the, of the Paris Basin that you were mentioning? Um, it's actually, it's a, it's technically, it's what's known as an outlier of the Paris Basin. So it's like a freestanding hill, pretty good size hill that's connected to what's in geological terms called the Cuesta of the Paris Basin. But uh, anyhow, so it's, it's essentially, it's, it's almost freestanding and vines go almost all the way around it, which is, especially at that latitude, fairly remarkable because there's vineyards on the north facing slopes on the east facing slopes and on the south facing slopes and uh, uh so it's it actually starts just south of the city of Wounds. so then you go up the hill and then you're at the top and then you can either go down to the east or to the north side or to the south side it's um it's uh difficult because you can't really go around the base of it but uh but you go up to the top and then you can shoot down to wherever you need to be. So, so that's uh, an interesting region. It's mostly, but not exclusively devoted to Pinot Noir. People always say that's where all the Pinot Noir is, but actually there's a number of villages where Chardonnay dominates. Um, and then there are some parts, uh, uh, especially in the part that's called the Petit Montagne, the Little Mountain, which is sort of off to the side, where they grow a lot of Meunier. And so those are the three main grapes in Champagne. Those account for more than 98% of the total planted. There's actually seven grapes in total that are authorized, but but uh, but 98.5% is uh, Chardonnay, Pinot Noir, and Meunier. Sometimes people say Pinot Meunier, but in Champagne, they usually just say Meunier. So those are more or less a third of each, which is more or less the blend of an average a uh, non-vintage blend. And then if you have one that's entirely Chardonnay, it's called a Blanc de Blanc. And then if you have one that's black grapes, it's called a Blanc de Noir. And a Blanc de Noir can be 100% Pinot Noir. It is most often that. It can also be 100% Meunier, which is m much more rare. And sometimes it's a blend of Meunier and Pinot Noir. 
And so before we before we carry on with our tour and get to the other regions, can you just give us a quick idea of what the stylistic characteristics of those three varietals are? So if you have a Blonde Noir or a Pinot Noir based champagne, what can you expect versus if you have a Blanc de Blanc or a Chardonnay based champagne? Sure. They always say that Chardonnay brings the brilliance and uh, the freshness to the blend, that Pinot Noir brings the substance, the ageability, and the power to the blend, and the Meunier brings the fruit and floral aromas to the blend. That's, uh, in a nutshell, typically what they say. It's, it's quite often that you have uh, Blanc de Blanc champagnes. I guess it's a relatively common style. Blanc de Noir is perhaps somewhat less common. You can run a risk, unless you're a skillful winemaker and careful in the way you do it, that it can be a little heavy because it's uh, it's more substantial, there's more extract, there's more power, and there's less sort of overt fruit aromas. Um, in the hands of a skilled winemaker, it can be a really great style. And you find those often in the, the southern slopes of the, of the Montagna, um, and often in the Cote de Bar as well. Um, and then Meunier, 100% Meunier champagnes are starting to get more and more popular. People, Meunier has always suffered a little bit by comparison to Pinot Noir and, and Chardonnay. Um, what they always say in the region is that, sorry, is that uh, Chardonnay takes the bubble best. And so it's uh, thought to be essential to the blend because it, the effervescence is the longest lasting and the most brilliant. Um, but they always have had a secret uh, affinity for, not, or not so secret, for Pinot Noir, which is seen as the most noble of the grapes. And uh, and Meunier is, the, th the thing about Meunier and the reason that it's grown in Champagne is that it's it's hardier than Pinot Noir. It's easier to grow than Pinot Noir because it buds out later and it ripens earlier. So it's not as susceptible to frost in the springtime or rain at harvest. And because of the fact that it's a little more resilient than Pinot Noir, it's often been planted in the crappy locations. Because it's been planted in the crappy locations, it, it's gotten sort of a bad rep. But there's nothing innately inferior, really. And Meunier planted in a, in a good location can actually be superb. So people kind of look down on Meunier and 100% and Meunier champagnes were, were made, but they were, there were none that were prestigious. And, and so now that's starting to change and it's getting to be kind of a trendy thing to, to have 100% Meunier champagnes. We're on the tour now, so let's continue with the tour. We did the Montagna, let's carry on with the others. And if you can again point out some of the key styles or the varietals, that'd be great. Okay, so just south of the city are the north-facing slopes of the Montagne. Yep. And as you circumnavigate in a clockwise direction, you end up on the south side. The south side of the Montagne flows right into the Valley de la Marne, so the Marne River Valley. So the Montagne stops at, at the Marne River. And, and there are grapes lining the Marne River for quite a distance. It's uh, about... Uh, the 80 kilometers worth of, uh, of vineyards. So it's, it's a pretty good distance. And uh, there's grapes on the right bank of the Marne, which are uh, thought to be better because they're south facing slopes. So generally they are better. And then there's vines on the south bank or the left bank, which are not considered as good. But then, then there's other sort of little sub-regions in there. There's the uh, valley of the Surmelin, for example, uh, and then there's the Western Marne. So that whole region, there's all three grape varieties planted, but it's really dominated largely by uh, Meunier. So that's, that's what it's known for, although you can easily find all three grape varieties there. And that goes back almost as to the outskirts of Paris. Well, not really, but it, it's the westernmost region uh, of Champagne. And um, so the the town of Epernay is also located on the Martin River and uh, flows right through it. And south of uh, the town of Epernay is the Côte de Blanc. So it sort of starts there, goes south. And the people think it's a little bit confusing because when you say Côte de Blanc, it means a specific part that starts in Chouilly and ends in uh, Vertu, which is the 
the, what technically, if you wanted to be technically correct, I think you'd call the principal quest sub the Cote de Blanc. But there's actually a bunch of other subregions that are usually grouped together and considered also part of the Cote de Blanc, just because Chardonnay dominates all of them. So immediately to the south of that main part. So the main part that I just said, the principal cuesta, essentially, is where all the Grand Cru's and all the Premier Cru's bar one are located. And uh, so, so after the main part, then you come to what's known as the Coteau de Petit Morin. The Petit Morin is another river. There's uh, vines on the slopes of that river and sort of in the back country around there as well. Um, again, dominated by Chardonnay. Then to the south of that is uh, the Coteau du Cézanne, which is the area around Cézanne, which is sort of like a subregion of the Côte de Blanc. It's again, mostly Chardonnay. Some of those two areas have uh, black grapes, so mostly uh, uh, Meunier, but some Pinot Noir, but not so much Pinot Noir. And, uh, and then there's a considerable gap, and then you come to another region called Nwongu, which is uh, 100% Chardonnay. It's just one village. It's outside of the city of Troyes, <coughs> excuse me, where uh, Joan of Arc is from. And uh, Troyes is one of the most beautiful places in the world. I love going to Troyes. I almost always go to Troyes for many reasons, because I love the wines of Mongo, and it's on the border of the Côte de Bar. And also that's where Andriette are from. And I'm a huge fan of Andriette. I don't know if you know Andriette. It's a sausage made by stuffing intestines inside more intestines. So it's a, it's a <laughs> Sounds it's like so, it would go well with champagne. It goes it's superbly well with champagne. It also goes with Chablis because it's, it's it was not very far from the border with Chablis. So if you drove straight from Reims to Troyes, you'd be like 90 minutes on the freeway. So it's a long way. And there's some vineyards to uh, along that way from the uh, Coteau de Petit Morin and the Cézanne, etc. But there's a bunch of nothing in between. And uh, and then you get down uh, outside of Troyes, south, sort of south uh, east of Troyes, the, what's called the Côte de Bar. There's the two parts. There's the Bar Secane and the Bar sur Aubois. And uh, it's a pretty big subregion. It actually accounts for 20% of all the grapes uh, that are planted in Champagne. And once again, you come in, it's very weird, and no one's ever been able to explain it properly to me. But uh, uh, in the Côte de Bar, well, actually, no, I, I do have a, sort of an explanation. But anyhow, it's dominated by Pinot Noir. 90% of the grapes planted are Pinot Noir. The thing is, the soil is completely different. It's no longer chalk, like we were talking about for the rest of the region. It's actually Kimmeridgen, Marl Kimmeridgen, Limestone Kimmeridgen, Clay, like which Chablis. are the same, like Chablis. And it's right on the border with Chablis. So once you're in the in the Côte de Bar, you're literally only 40 kilometers from uh, Chablis itself. And you're literally less than 10 kilometers from the border with the Côte d'Or, the uh, Département. So it's like right there. And in Chablis, they have the same soil type, and uh, it's all planted to Chardonnay, almost all planted to Chardonnay, whereas in the Côte de Mar, it's all planted to Pinot Noir. The reason, really, is that uh, the Côte de Mar did not have a huge number of producers of its own, and most of the growers who were there were selling the grapes to the negociant houses that were based in and around saint epernay and those guys were buying... Uh, Pinot Noir. So it was more an economical thing. Uh, it was more about economics than it was about viticulture, really. And uh, because I think, you know, there's still very little Chardonnay down there. And uh, I think when they do grow Chardonnay, it's super successful. And uh, that's uh, the Cote de Bar is, uh, is also the place where most of the other grape varieties are found. When you find them, you don't find them that much. But but there's Pinot Blanc, there's Pinot Gris, there's Arban, there's Petit Melier, um, and those are mostly found in uh, the Côte de Bar. So just to sum up, there's the Montagne de Rhin, there's the Valle de la Marne that goes to the west, there's the Côte de Blanc, and then we continue on the Côte de Cézanne and the Côte de Bar. Now, in terms of quality, would you say that the first three, the Montagne de Rhin, the Valle de la Marne, and the Côte de Blanc, tend to be associated with higher quality than the other two, or is there, is it really more producer dependent? 
No, it totally depends on producers. Now, there's absolutely exquisite champagnes produced in all of those places. Yeah, I don't think you can generalize. I think they're very different terroir, but uh, oh, and there's one part of the the Cote de Blanc I didn't mention. I don't know why is the Vitreat. It just occurred to me that I left out the Vitreat. It's a smallish region, and it's it's very far east of the rest of it. It's sort of it's sort of due north of the Cote de Bar, which is what made me think of it just now. But anyhow, I think uh, that you could. I I would not at all say that the Marne produces higher quality champagne than the old, for example. Interesting. Okay. So speaking of quality, let's talk about another distinction that, distinction that I think people sometimes associate does speak to quality is the distinction between houses and grower champagnes. Because first explain what those two terms mean. And then I do think some people assume that growers may be higher quality than houses. Maybe they assume the other way, but I'd also be curious on your thoughts there. So can you explain those two terms? Sure. So uh, in Champagne, it's a very highly regulated uh, industry, and they're required to declare on the label the uh, uh, statute under which they're organized. So there are negociants who buy, who often own vineyards, and in fact, some own very extensive vineyards, um, but they're distinguished by the fact that they buy grapes and or juice and or finished wine and blend the champagnes um, and then age them. And then there are recolton manipulants, who uh, recolton means a harvester and manipulant means a manufacturer. So they're people that make wine from their own uh, production. And then there, there are other statutes as well. There's co-ops. Co-ops are, are uh, about, account for about 10% of the total. Um, and so there's uh, cooperatives, and then there are people that just, uh, there's Marc Dacheteur, which is uh, uh, somebody who doesn't make wine at all, but just uh, invents a label and, and slaps a label on it. And and uh, within each of those uh, categories, there there are variations as well. There's Recolton Coopérateur, so that's somebody who grows grapes but delivers their grapes to the co-op and then the co-op makes the wine and gives them bottles of finished wine back and they put their own label on it. So most of the, so it's R, C, R, M, C, M, N, M, and M, A. Those are the, when you look at the label, that's what uh, you'll see in very fine print on the bottom of the label. And uh, and that's the secret to that. And, and you had mentioned that some people assumed that growers were higher in quality, innately higher in quality than negotiants. And I, I don't think that's true at all. Um, I think that that would be, I think, so uh, negotiants account for about 80% of all the wine that's produced in, in Champagne. And there are uh, uh, amazingly high quality negociants and there are amazingly crap quality negociants and so there's a full and a full range my uh, preferred brand of champagne i will show you is Krug. Oh, you have it handy and oh yeah i always keep a bottle of Krug <laughs> lying around but um but anyhow uh, for me that's by far my my preferred champagne and they're a negociant they own some vineyards, but they buy in most of their fruit, as do most negociants. And so, you know, I, I don't think given that one example or so many other examples, uh, like Boulanger is a negociant uh, and Tatanger is a negociant. And, you know, a lot of the champagnes that, that we really love to drink are produced by negociants. And so uh, I don't think there's any way you could possibly say they're, they're innately... Uh, lower in quality than somebody who grows the grapes themselves and makes their own wine. Then they're limited by uh, their own vineyards as to what uh, is available to them to make champagne with. And now there are some extraordinarily high quality uh, uh, Recolton manipulants who grower champagnes. And, and I do drink a lot of grower champagne. Um, but I'll tell you the truth of the matter is this. So I have 
my wife and I, we probably drink champagne three to five nights a week. We have a lot of champagne, along with Burgundy. That's what we drink in my house. That's the key to a happy marriage, I suppose. It is right? indeed. <laughs> that is indeed. It's, it's definitely one of them. So, uh, so we always have champagne lying around the apartment. And it's almost always non-vintage champagne, quite often from uh, a grower. But I also have a not gigantic, but uh, a satisfyingly growing collection of wines that's in professional storage. And that is almost all, with a few exceptions, but almost all Grand Marc houses, so Negocian houses. Most of it's crew. There's a lot of Dom Perignon. There's some Claude de Guas. There's Tetanger Comte de Champagne. Cases of it lying there unopened, waiting for it to mature properly. So for me, if you're laying wines down, uh, it's almost always the Negocian, the Grand, you know, the Prestige Cubes from the Negocian houses. And if you're drinking it tonight or next week or something, it's almost always non-vintage wine from the growers. And so that's the way I sort it out. Everyone has their own. And there are, it's not to say that there aren't prestige cuvées from growers that are capable of aging 30, 40, 50 years. That definitely is is a thing. But it's relatively more rare to find that than the alternative. And conversely, I find, to be quite honest and blunt, since we're just amongst friends here, that the non-vintage blends from the big negociant houses uh, are often kind of boring. So I don't really buy them. And I find that they charge a premium for them because of the brand recognition. And so I don't think they they represent value in the same way as some of those really exciting non-vintage blends from from growers can. But but when it comes to laying wine down, so in other words, if I'm spending fifty or sixty bucks, I'm buying grower juice all day long. If I'm spending two, three, four, five, six hundred dollars or more on a bottle of champagne, which I do with some regularity, it's almost always prestige cuvee from a grown mark house. Interesting. So the reason I asked the question is because I do think grower champagnes has become sort of a trend, right? You hear a lot of people talking about grower champagnes and seeking these out. Uh, but I agree with you. I think some of the finest wines from the region are those, uh, the Grand Marc, higher quality, prestige cuvée. So that was a great overview. So I think, you know, out. just not to go down the rabbit hole, but but just to, to talk economics a little bit, in truth, Recolton Manipulant as a percentage of the total is relatively small. There's less, mm -hmm. it's the smallest of the three. Between the three big groups, Negociants, Co-ops, and Growers, Growers are the smallest. And of the grow, what, what people think are growers, a lot of them are Recolton Coopérateur, which is uh, somebody who's growing their own grapes, but having the juice made at the co-op, which to me, that lacks all interest. And then... Uh, so if you take out just the growers, the Recolton Manipulant, really, uh, there's a lot of them that are good, but, you know, they're nothing to write home about. Of the ones that, that are really special, really there's probably like 200 that are special. And of that, there's really maybe 50 that have started to come to people's attention and and there's probably 20 that are ferociously trendy and are starting to sell for serious money so it's a relatively small thing i think it's getting more share of mind among collectors and and well-heeled consumers but the the total amount of grower champagne is actually declining mm -hmm. and uh, even as the notoriety of the most famous ones continues to increase well, speaking of the wines that you are lying down, let's just talk about aging champagne for a moment before we get into the process of how it's made. So is champagne a wine that we can age and what happens to it as you age it? Yes, definitely you can age it. And I think it's a mistake to drink the best champagnes before their 20 years of age is, is an error. And uh, most of them would benefit by being, you know, 30 to 40 years of age. Um, but they can often last 60, 70 years, 70 years. That's, that's like 1950. So, you know, the, the wines from the fifties, there's no reason they, you know, if they're properly stored that they shouldn't be amazing and they can last longer than that. So the oldest champagne I've, I've had 
that still had bubbles and was was fun to drink because I've had older champagnes, but they they were kind of shot. But but the oldest one that I had that was really a, a delight to drink was a bottle of twenty six crew that I had in like 2012 so it would have been like 85 years of age so it can de- they can definitely age i would say as long as uh most bordeaux or burgundy really and what happens is they get deeper in color they lose some of their fizz it's often the case that that i mean first of all they so they get deeper in color you don't want them to be brown but they can be a deep golden color if they're from the uh, 60s or 50s, you would sort of expect that. And then the mousse, which is what the how the French refer to the bubbles, the mousse can be relatively faint at that age, but there should be some. And like I said, I've had bottles that still had fizz in uh, from the 20s. So it's definitely, I've had more than just that one, a number of them. Um, but you, as you go further back in time, you get more and more bottles that don't have any bubbles. And sometimes they can be good to drink, but they just don't have any bubbles. And and then at that point, it's like drinking white burgundy. And that, that can still be fun, but you're sort of missing one element of it. And then uh, what happens to the flavor? It gets more complex, sort of like white burgundy along the same line. So you can have eventually, you know, creamy aromas, then toasty aromas, then more umami aromas, and then ultimately like, truffle and forest floor and you know it ages in a similar way to to white burgundy and and the ones that have a lot of pinot noir you can get some of the notes of red burgundy even you know i think usually if you go as far as like soy sauce for example then it's like kind of too far but but um but it it definitely gets really complex very pungent uh, Drinking old champagne is is one of the great pleasures in in life. In fact, as you probably know, you're going to let me plug my book, right? Vintage Champagne, uh, 1899 to 2019. So I look at 120 uh, years of worth of vintages and at 120 different producers. And I talk about all of them that I've had, um, not all of them, but many of them that I've had over the years. So I love uh, mature champagne and uh, and I think really, you know, it, vintage champagne is good to drink at at any age. But like I said, it's kind of a waste to drink it if it's not 20 years of age. For example, I think uh, there's a definitely when I'm buying vintage champagne to lay down, there's a there's a, it, it ages often six, eight, ten years before they release it into the market. Right now, the top houses are releasing their 2012s, for example. So they've been aging in the cellars in Champagne for 10 years. But you need a, at least another 10 years before they're ready to drink. And then the 2008s are a great vintage that's been released. But to me, they're not ready to drink yet. I think, you know, four is a good vintage to drink. Um, two is a good vintage, a really good vintage to drink now. Um and then, you know, every vintage is slightly different and it requires to understand when to drink it requires. Uh, requires uh, your book. Analogy. What's that? A my book, yeah. <laughs> it but, also, but also you should know what you like because some people don't like older champagne and some people really love it. So, you know, for me, the sweet spot is between, you know, in terms of like what I can afford and what I can find in the market and what's going to be in good condition. The sweet spot is sort of 79 to 88. That's where I'm drinking most of my vintage champagne, when I'm bringing vintage champagne. And then to me, anything older than that, you know, like early 70s and before is is definitely mature, Some which some people don't even like. But, but then there's great, loads of great vintages in the 60s, 69, 66, 64, 62 are all great vintages. And then you know, and then, but then after that, it starts getting expensive. So you have to be prepared to step up. Like to get proper stock from the early 60s, late 50s, you're talking at least uh, one to $4,000 a bottle, something like that. 
which, you know, it's interesting you point out. And by the way, I was going to hold up your book as well, because I have my copy <laughs> handy. And I'm very happy that 1988 turned out to be a very good vintage because that is my birth year. So I need to oh, one of up my something. favorites. You should I, have. A I know I read the chapter on 1988. Right. <laughs> so I'm very uh, chuffed to go out and, and stock up. But what so so for those higher quality wines that you think need about 20 years of age, at that stage, is that just to you the optimal balance of the mousse is in a good position, the the complexity, like you said, it involves kind of on the flavor side, like a white burgundy on the aromatic side. Is it all sort of in that in that sweet spot after 20? And, and what's the maybe like 20 to 40? That's where it starts to hit its sweet spot, and it, it, it ramps up for at least another 20 years before that. So to figure 20 years back is 02. For the top wines, I don't want to drink anything younger than 02. It doesn't make any sense. And then there's a really great period from like 02 to 82 are great vintage. There's, there's, it's a great chunk and the wines are, should be all in really great condition. And there's some really great vintages in there. And so that's like the sweet spot that 20 years. And then, and then, so sort of 82 to 62, the wines are more mature and it's more of a specialist thing like for serious collectors and the wines are much more expensive. And then older than 62, they're kind of ferociously expensive. Mm. And uh, But even then, as you mentioned in your book, the price for even those very exclusive champagnes is still going to be lower than the top quality of Burgundy, for Burgundy, example. For example, yes, indeed. It, it's There's still plenty of... Uh, of uh, room to add value for them to appreciate. And I think that they will. The market's been very, very strong for collectible champagne. It's been getting stronger all the time. The top wines, you know, the thing about champagne that makes it interesting from the perspective of collecting them is that uh, people tend to drink champagne. You know, it, people tend to drink DRC too, but at a slower rate. I mean, I think if you're buying top end Burgundy, it's almost assumed you're going to lay it down and it's going to be like a special occasion thing. But champagne, even the best champagne, people open and drink because they're celebrating, because it has that association with celebration, with festivity, with New Year's, with closing a deal, with a big birthday, something like that. And uh, Or and just a so regular I, Tuesday at the Curtis household, it seems. Oh, yeah. That's what I'm talking about. That's how we roll in my house. I need to come visit more often. Indeed you do. Charles, let's get into the most difficult topic to cover in a short amount of time, the process of how champagne is made, because this is what makes it really special. So there are many steps involved here. Let's try to do them all at a high level just to give people a sense of how this works. But can you walk us through from the pressing? We don't have to spend too much time on the viticulture. We did talk about how it's cooler, so so your grapes might not be as ripe as in other places. But let's start from pressing and go through all the way to final bottling ah but i disagree because <laughs> all right the, the, you win. the first thing that you need to mention which is is uh, uh almost unique in champagne is that by law you have to pick by hand so in a lot of other regions that's not the case so you ha you must pick by hand and uh that's where it starts because you have to press whole bunches so the pressing is a very important step and it's required it's required that they be whole bunches and the thing that makes champagne different is that you're allowed to press only a given amount of juice uh for a set quantity of fruit so you're allowed to press not that you need to know the exact numbers but you're allowed to press 2550 liters out of 4000 kilograms which is a very light and gentle pressing and the reason that they insist on that is to ensure the elegance and the delicacy of the of the wine, but also because you've got uh, two in the normal makeup of things, you've got two thirds black grapes and one third white grapes, but more often than not, you're making white wine. And the only way to do that, all the color is in the skin. So you have to press it very gently. That's why the re the regulations sort of started. Uh, and, but it's a, it's a qualitative thing because that gentle pressing means that the wine is going to be very elegant and so so the pressing is uh, slow and uh, sometimes it's pneumatic presses and sometimes it's vertical presses the vertical presses are more um, traditional but but some people use a pneumatic press um, and then you you separate that juice into sections the first section is called the cuvee 
which is uh, 2,050 liters. And then there's 500 liters of what's called Thai, which is a slightly harder press. And then anything above that uh, gets sent to the distillery. People don't realize it, but you're required to press all the juice out of it, but you're also required to account for it and that you sent it to the distillery. So it gets distilled into uh, grain neutral spirit for like industrial uses. So um, that that pressing uh, step is, is super important in champagne. Then you've got grape juice. And what you do is you ferment it into wine, Abdi, and... Uh, the way you do that, though, can be it can be done in any number of different ways. Uh, traditionally, if you go back like the pre-1950, it was all done in oak casks. And uh, in the 50s, then some people started doing it in uh, in concrete. And then by the 60s and into the 70s, more people were switching to stainless steel. Now there's a lot of people that ferment in stainless steel. They like it because it's neutral and you can control the temperature very easily. But there's also a lot of people that ferment in in cask. That there's a lot of people that never stopped, and there's other people that went back to it after uh, uh, experimenting with concrete or stainless. And now there's people fermenting in amphora in glass jars, and just like in a lot of regions. But by you know the the basic choice is cask or stainless, and uh, that's an important. Uh, step and it contributes to the flavor of the wine then after that you've got another important step which is whether or not you're going to do malolactic conversion so uh, it used to be the case that it was always done and then some people decided to block it uh, if you block malolactic conversion then you have more malic acid so it's a, a racier acidity more tartness but the people that block mallow often will uh, compensate for that in the dosage uh, section but uh, anyhow so so whether or not you do mallow is important and after you do it or block it then you bottle the wine and when you bottle the wine you bottle it with yeast and sugar and uh, then you put a, a cap or a cork in the bottle it used to always be a cork and then uh, starting in the in the 50s it got to be much more common that you put a crown cap like you find on beer or soda or something like that um and so now most of it is that way because it's easier to manipulate but there are other people that are going back to using cork during this stage but anyhow you you close the bottle one way or the other then there's a second another fermentation i think it's always very uh confusing to, if you talk about when you talk about the fermentations and you give it a number because you've got the primary fermentation, which is the alcoholic fermentation. Then you've got malolactic conversion, which some people say malolactic fermentation. It's not really a fermentation because it happens from bacteria and not from yeast. Um, so that's uh, something of a misnomer. Then people say the second fermentation for the part where the bubbles go in, the technically in, well, at least the French refer to it as the pleas de mousse. That's, that's the, the best way to refer to it because that's what's essentially is what's happening it's the the taking of the bubble but uh, the yeast consumes the sugar that you've added with it and creates a small amount of alcohol like one more percent of alcohol and gives off carbon dioxide uh, in as a gas but because the bottle is closed the gas doesn't escape and the bubbles stay in solution inside the bottle and then what happens is the yeast keeps uh, fermenting until all the sugar is gone and then it doesn't have anything to eat and then it dies or yeast and uh, it starts to break down in a process called autolysis which means self breaking down and uh, it's that decomposition essentially to not to put too fine a sheen on it, it that gives champagne its unique aromas and flavors and the and that's why they mandate a minimum amount of aging in Champagne. They do in other regions too, but in Champagne, the the legal minimum are 15 months for non-vintage and three years for vintage. But that legal minimum is almost always exceeded in top quality producers. And so, so that aging period is uh, essential to the final character of the wines. And and as I, as I alluded to earlier, sometimes it can be... Uh, up to 10 years for the best cuvee. And then more and more people are producing 
wines with even more extended aging. So it can be 20 years, it can be 30 years, uh, like crew collection or- Of lease contact? Yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah, crude collection or Dom Perignon P2, P3, wines like that used to be called Eau de Tech. And there's more and more people that are releasing the wines later and later. And I think it's it's an interesting thing for champagne. But anyhow, you, you let it go as long as you want to let it go or as long as you can afford to let it go. Because see, that speaks to the economics of the thing. Is almost everybody who also records on many belong are using their own grapes. For them, it's just a, a delay in their cash flow. But for a negociant, they bought the grapes and they probably borrowed the money to buy the grapes. And so they've been paying interest on that loan for all of those years. If it's like 10 years, they've been paying 10 years worth of interest. So that aging period adds enormously to the cost of champagne. People think champagne is a luxury item and it is a luxury, but it's a super affordable luxury when you consider the cost factors that go into production, which we don't have time to go into today. But that's just one example of... of uh, well, anyhow, we don't want to go down that particular rabbit hole. But anyhow, the aging adds considerably to the expense. And once you're done aging, you've got a bottle of wine that will be delicious, but it's got all that dead yeast in there that looks like, like, goop. It looks like, yeah, schmutz in the bottom of the bottle, and you got to get it out. So, so what you do is a process in English we call riddling, which can be done. You know, they always show the guys doing it by hand, but it can also be done by machine. And qualitatively, it doesn't change the quality of the wine to, to do it by machine or by hand. But but what you're doing is gathering the, the dead yeast cells at the neck of the bottle, and then you uh, take them out. So if you've stopped up the bottle with a cork, you have to do it by hand. Um, and if you are using a crown cap, you can do it by machine. You So almost all champagne is done by freezing the neck of the bottle, and then it goes through a machine, and it, it removes the cap, and the pressure inside the bottle, there's six bars of pressure, causes the, the plug of ice and all the dead yeast cells to come shooting out, and then you top it up. And what you top it up with is wine, and sometimes you add sugar to that wine, which is called the dosage. And... There's different levels of sweetness. Um, uh, people think uh, uh, champagne has always been the way it is, but it, it's actually been evolving over the several hundred years that the method has been developed. Um, what we most commonly drink today is called brut champagne. It's, it's called brut because they used to think that it was brutish to drink champagne like that, which is very dry. Originally, if you go back even... 150 years, all champagne was sweet. It was always served at dessert and it had more sugar in it. There are definitely bottles from the 19th century that they found that had over 200 grams of sugar per liter in it, which is more than port. It's more weight. It's like double the amount of sugar of Sauterne. So it was like really, really sweet. And the reason they added all that sugar was to hide the fact that it tasted kind of nasty without all that sugar. So um, then as the quality of the wine and the winemaking got better, they could serve it with less sugar. And, but that's really a 20th century sort of development. And uh, late 19th century was the time the first uh, champagnes that are called Brut were developed. So, so Brut is a fairly wide band. It's anything from zero to, to 12 grams per liter. Um, most brute is between six and 12 grams. Most of it is right around eight grams per liter. If it's less than six, it can be called just brute, but often it's called extra brute. And uh, if it says uh, brute nature or, or brute zero or something like that, it means that there's no added sugar. It doesn't mean there's no sugar because sometimes there's a little bit from the wine making process that's still in there. It means that there was no sugar added to it. So that's Brut Natur, Extra Brut, and Brut goes up to 12. And then after that, it gets very confusing because the next one after that is Extra Sec. So Sec means dry or Extra Dry, Extra Sec, but that's 12 to 17 grams per liter. So you, but you would think if it was Extra Dry, it would be drier, but it's not. So anyhow, there's Extra Sec. Then there's Sec, which is 17 to 35 grams per liter. And that's it says dry on the label, but it doesn't taste dry to us. It tastes sweet but not super sweet, just like slightly sweet. And then there's demi-sec, which is um, 35 uh, to 50 grams per liter. And then there's du, which is 50 grams and over, which is a very rare style, and most people don't make it. 
And and so you can see that that uh, you know much more than ninety percent of all champagne is brewed uh, today. Um, mm. And so it's evolved over time. And then uh, so you add the dosage. And then if you're a quality producer, you let it sit for another six months so that the dosage gets uh, uh, e evenly spread throughout the bottle and it has time to sort of harmonize. And then uh, at that point, after the dosage, you put the final cork, you put the cage on it, the foil, and then you're ready to ship. See, this is what I think is so fascinating about champagne is the process is so involved, right? So getting back to our, our point about quality and price, not only are the raw materials and the actual inputs into the wine expensive, so so it's you know not that cheap to make champagne, but then there's so much work involved and so many steps. So really, when you think about the price of top champagne, you are getting a little bit of a bargain, aren't you? Just considering how You're much- You're definitely getting a bargain. It used to be that if you go back to the late 19th century, for example, the uh, champagne from the top negociant houses sold for as much as uh, first growth Bordeaux. It was like on a bar. And so uh, there's no way that's the case today. There's a few that sell for that amount of money, but it's relatively rare. So you, you're getting a wine that's super expensive to make. It has a very complicated process. It has immense potential for aging and, uh, and it's being sold effectively at a knockdown price. I think it's a great category. With huge upside in terms of aging, both in terms of uh, wine quality and in terms of potential appreciation for the collector. So let's delve a little bit into one step in the process that I think is so interesting is the actual blending before we get to the, the second fermentation. So can you just talk through that? Because you mentioned that we make wine and it's maybe not the top quality wine <laughs> deliberately. So it's not going to be something you're going to want to drink pure. And I know you've had those, those wines, the, uh, the pre secondary fermentation, pre mm -hmm. pre wines, and they're quite tart and angular. But then the blending is actually quite a complicated process that really relies on the experience of the winemaker. So can you ex just explain that a little bit, how that part works? Sure. It, you know, so uh, every champagne, no matter what it is, is a blend of something. I mean, even for a, a recolton manipulant, even from a grower where all the stuff is coming from one, one vineyard site, he's got to make several different batches of it and you got to have to blend that together. But often the growers will blend in different vineyard sites or uh, the different grape varieties. And quite often in Champagne, uh, much more so than in other regions, they blend in different vintages, which the majority of the Champagne that we drink is not vintage. And so it can be vintages that are kept separately, or it can be what's what they refer to erroneously as a Solera. It's technically uh, the word in Champagne is Reserve Perpetuelle. Um, where they t they have a tank and uh, they take out the amount of wine for blending that they need for a certain year and then they top up the tank with wine from the current year. So a perpetual reserve. It's not really a Solera in the sense of uh, sherry, but uh, but those that's one option. The other option is to keep all the years separate and to blend it together. So the negotiate that's mostly big negotiations that have that many tanks because a small grower is not going to have that much tank space to keep it all separate and you have to maintain the temperature and you have to, um, you know, keeping the wine for a number of years is, is a complicated sort of process. Um, but, uh, but be that as it may, almost all champagne, more than 90% of the market is, is a blend of different vintages. So vintage champagne is a relatively, relatively small sec segment of the market. And then there's, uh, prestige cuvee champagne which is an even smaller segment of the market but anyhow i was digressing just for a moment but uh, the big what i was starting to say is that the big negotiation houses that that are making really large quantity blends can often have several hundred different individual lots between the different uh, grape varieties and the different villages and the different years and and so it, it's quite often that they have between one and three hundred different individual things that are being blended together and and it's usually not done you know by the whim of the winemaker usually they'll have a committee that does it and it's the whole winemaking staff so at a at a big house like that you'll have one guy who's the boss it, uh, they call him the chef de cave 
but he works with winemakers because you don't run an operation that size with just one guy making wines. You've got five or six people, and then they sit along with, you know, a guy from marketing and a guy from finance, and and they all taste the wines and they all uh, do it blind, and then they compare the notes. And it used to be that they had to write up tasting sheets on everything, and now they put it into computers, just like judging a wine competition. And it comes out and they have all the results. And then it's the chef de cop that decides what the final blend is going to be. So he's ultimately responsible. It's his fault if it tastes like crap. But but uh, he's certainly not doing all that work by himself. Because that, that usually... So champagne is picked earlier than... than uh, in fact, they're getting ready to pick in not too long a time. It's picked earlier than wines, you know, still wines, grapes for making still wine. And uh, so the fermentation process is done earlier. And uh, it's usually the case that the fermentations are done and dusted by, you know, before Christmas. Then everybody has a nice holiday. They all go skiing and then they come back. And starting it in sort of mid to late January, they start to work on the blends. And that typically is like a, at least a three or four month process of tasting every day because you've got to taste all the lots, and if you are blending 250 lots in round numbers or something, you've got to go through all 250 of them. Um, and often, you know, most often more than once, but you've also got to taste all the reserve wines. And if you're keeping the vintages of reserve wines separate, you've got to taste, you know, through hundreds of samples of that. And then you have to taste potential blends. And so it literally takes months of tasting, you know, Usually they don't taste all day because you you get palate fatigue, but typically you'll taste all morning until lunch every day for three or four months straight. So it's a yeah fairly rigorous process. And how difficult is it when you're tasting those wines at that stage to anticipate how they'll evolve once they've gone through secondary and once they've had the dosage added? Because there's so many intervening steps there before you get to the final product. Like when you've been around, do you, do you find it difficult to tell what that wine will contribute to the final blend? Well, I think practice works perfect. I mean, the more you taste, uh, I go and taste Van Clare. So the the still wines before they put the bubbles in are called Van Clare, the base, or in English they usually just say base wines, but, but the French is the Van Clare. If you have a still wine that's made for intentional consumption without bubbles, it's called Coteau Champenois, so it has a different appellation. It's, you can only call it champagne if it has bubbles. If it doesn't have bubbles, it's called Coteau Champenois. But, uh, yeah, I've been going every year for more than 20 years to taste uh, by Claire. And uh, winemakers who do it exclusively that for a living have done it much longer than I have. And practice makes perfect. I mean, after a while, you, you taste the wines as by Claire, and then you have sort of an idea. Then you go back and taste them when they're finished. Then you go back and taste them again after they've been in, you know, after they've been released for five years and 10 years and, you know, so, so you, you figure it out eventually. It's not easy, but it requires practice. I always say the more you drink, the more, you know, that is the best way to learn this particular topic, isn't it? And the it most fun. The so let's jump to trends now in Champagne. We've done a great coverage of the region. We've talked about the grapes and the process, but what are some trends that you see afoot in Champagne right now, whether among producers or just among the collectors that you work with? So I think in terms of producers, things are definitely changing. We talked a little bit about the trend for 100% Meunier, and we talked about the rise of prominence of the uh, Growers in the Côte de Bar, I think there's loads of top quality wines coming out of the Côte de Bar, um, and not not exclusively growers, but but most of the ones that have come to people's attention have been have been growers. I do think that the idea of uh, releasing Côte de Champenois is getting increasingly popular, and then I think there was a trend for uh, Brut Nature that went maybe went a little bit too far. And I think it was it was super trendy for a while. And now a lot of people have realized that a little bit of dosage actually um, helps the wines age. And I think that they've come back from the break. I think really the 
most most of the quality producers are now in that sort of extra brut range, like two to six grams per liter. And uh, the brut nature is, is slightly less. Where that there's an exception that's often made is in the Cote de Bar because it's further south and the base wines are riper. And so you can do uh, brut nature a little more effectively. And so I think that's definitely a trend in both of those directions. So brut nature from the Cote de Bar and extra brut from the Marne. And then I think, you know, there's definitely an increasing trend towards uh, uh, producing champagnes with the name of the place that they've, uh, the grapes have been produced. And uh, that's become increasingly prominent, especially among uh, growers. Sometimes the negotiate houses do the same thing. Um, but for grower champagnes, it's more and more prevalent. And those are kind of the main trends. There's other sort of smaller trends. Um, there's more and more people. They used to say they, that vintage champagne was made um, only in great years. And a lot of people took it as a point of pride that they only made a couple of vintages in a, in a, in a decade. But now there's a more and more a trend of people releasing vintage champagne every year. First of all, because with global warming, it's become possible possible to do that. And secondly, because they think, hey, you know, we're a region not so far from Burgundy, and the, if the Burgundians get to do it, then we want to do it too. So, so uh, it, the idea is that there's a an expression of terroir that that of what nature gives you every year, and so the champagne can reflect that and. Uh, so they're making vintage wines even in less prominent vintages. And then there's another trend that's uh, people that will make wine from just one vintage. They don't put the vintage on the label. And sometimes it's because they don't want it. They don't want to let it age for 36 months because they want it to be fresh and lively. And so... It will be all from one vintage, all from one harvest, but it's not a vintage that they can declare either because they didn't age it or just because they don't want to. Um, mm. So an unclaimed vintage, really. And that's a little bit of a trend, too. And uh, those are the uh, trends on the producer side. On the collector side, I think more and more people are are. Uh, investing in champagne, the secondary market in champagne has been very strong. Prices in the primary market have been going up. That's not a surprise. It's happening in every region. Um, but I think uh, the market for uh, collectible wine has, has continued to climb and there's been shortages of top wines. I think really, for, for me, the best advice is that people uh, pay attention, taste the wines as soon as they come out and buy the wines in the primary market and then put them away in age. I mean, that's what I do. I bought a bunch of eights. I bought a bunch of, I bought some twos. I drank most of them already, unfortunately. Um, some fours, luckily I still have some left. Those should be drinking soon. A bunch of eights. I'm still a buyer of 2008 and then I'm buying 2012. But it'll be a while before I get to one thing I want to follow up on in your trends with producers is you were speaking about the the mention of specific sites on bottles, that that's increasing. And there's obviously some very famous examples like Clos de Manil from uh, Krug that have been, that have some history behind them. But uh, we didn't have time to talk a lot about these specific sites and how there are actually Grand Cru sites and Premier Cru sites in Champagne. People may not know that, but I know that you're involved in a project right now to actually map the terroir and provide more information on this. So can you just tell us a little bit about this so that people can go find out more about the particular uh, sites and uh, terroirs? Sure. So I'm doing a project with a cartographer. So he does the maps and I do the commentary. Um, we, we're going village by village, and we've completed the Côte de Blanc. So that's what this is. This is the commentary for the Côte de Blanc map, which is a big map. It's as big as the the maps that you typically see of Burgundy. So it has all of the individual uh, vineyard names are listed on it for the principal villages. And then for the other regions like Côte de Petit Morin, Côte de Cézanne, those are sort of grouped together, and we don't call out all the individual vineyard names. But for the main 
Grand Cru and the principal premier crews like Aviz and Clement and Auger and Wapi, et cetera, et cetera. Those have every uh, vineyard name there. And in the commentary, I talk about the individual lines, the notable individual lines. There's no way you could do every single one, but but I get a fair number for every village in there. And uh, and I talk about the wines and the style that they're made in and uh, where they come from and why they taste the way they taste. That's definitely more and more people are paying attention to that. You know, it's it's somewhat inimical to the general ethos in Champagne. You know, when I talk to the, uh, the CIBC or, or people at the big negotiate houses, they say, ah, but Monsieur Champagne is a blended wine. And uh, it's often the case, but not exclusively the case. And I think there's more and more interest in those single vineyard champagne. Absolutely. Well, the other thing that I think uh, we should steer people towards just before we get to our lightning round, because I do want to get to our lightning round, is that if they do want to learn more about the specific producers, uh, definitely get your book, because this isn't just a compendium of the vintages. There's also great information on every producer. I really liked how you broke it into two sections. And uh, I have some light reading to do for the next few uh, the next few weeks. For the time you know, when you're on a plane going to Champagne, which this is very important, you know. Where I will be in T minus two hours, as you told me to drop what I'm doing and head on out of there. Oh, so. wow. Yes. Exactly. <laughs> I wish. I wish. Okay. Last thing. Lightning round. Let's go through okay. a few questions. You have one minute to answer each of these as they come. First, what is the greatest vintage of champagne? The one that we're drinking right now. So I think the greatest recent vintage of champagne is 2008. The, it's hard to say the greatest overall vintage because I think... You know, there's different periods. It goes like 20 years at a time. So recent vintage, definitely 08. Uh, before that, your vintage of 88 has a, is a strong contender. A lot of people would say 96, but I, I actually happen to prefer uh, 88. Uh, you could say of, of all the vintages in the last 50 years, it could be 79 or it could be 73. And then, uh, you know, I think there's a lot of strong possibilities in the in the more mature vintages. 55 is a top contender. Uh, 45 is a top contender. But really, if you want something that's that's going to really be a, a life changing experience, maybe find a, a bottle of 28 in good condition. 28? 28. Yeah, 28. Okay. Second, what is the greatest champagne you've ever had? Oh, that's easy. 79 Clos de Manil. I've had four bottles of it and uh, was the first vintage after the Krug family bought it. And uh, they ripped, they bought it in 71. They ripped it up, replanted it. So it was very young grapes, but uh, 79 was a great vintage and Clos de Manil is a great site. And that's by far the best uh, uh, champagne I've ever had. I w well, yeah, I would say yeah, by far. All four bottles that, that I've had are uh, are, have been really consistent and uh, I'll drink another one with you if you bring it over. If I acquire one or if I just come and show up, cause I'll do the second part. <laughs> Either way works for me. <laughs> Perfect. All right. Who is the top, you already gave this one away, but I'll ask you again. Who's the top champagne house currently in your estimation? I, I'm a crude lover. I really am. With good reason. So next. Who is the current top grower in your estimation? Ah, it's an interesting question. So in my book on champagne, the one that you were so kindly holding up, um, I actually put Krug in a separate category, as no doubt you've noticed. I, I, there's 120 producers and I rank all of them. It's, it's five stars, four stars, three stars, two stars, one star. And in the, so in the category right under Krug, there are seven producers. And those are producers whose wines sell on the secondary market. There's only one grower in that uh, category, and that's uh, Salas, Champagne Jacques Salas, which is used to be Anselm Salas, well, still is, but it's his son, Guillaume, who's taking over now. And those wines appreciate extremely well in the secondary markets. But you'd be hard-pressed to get me to say that those wines are better than the ones in the next category. Down the three-star section has some really amazing producers in it, there are 27, though, in that category. Those are people that I think are really top echelon 
uh, producers, mo mostly growers, but some negociants as well. Um, and, and really, you know, the only thing that separates them from that top category is that the wines don't really appreciate. They get better in the bottle, so they, they appreciate in quality, but the, you can't really use them as an investment. So I think, you know, if you're looking at the collectible market, it's mostly Grand Marc houses and sell-offs. And then outside of that, there's more and more wines that that are selling for expensive prices, but you're not going to really be able to buy in and then have it go up in price and then sell it. So, Who's a grower who's up and coming? That's one to watch. There's a lot of growers that are um, up and coming. It's hard to single out just one. I've got a number of them in the book. And I do think that uh, uh, you could say, I think a lot of the growers in the Cote de Bar are pretty interesting, like Cedric Bouchard, whose wine technically is called the uh, Rose de Jean. Um, that's definitely one to watch. But there's others that are sort of, you know, at that same level. And... Uh, uh, it'd be hard to pick exactly one, but that is definitely a very good example. Excellent. I do love Cedric Bouchard's wines, so great choice there. All right. Well, Charles, this has been another wonderful episode. I always wish we had more time because there's so much, especially with this topic. So I think at some stage we may have to do a follow-up. I told you it's a big topic. And the other thing I didn't tell you, but you should know by now, is that I like to talk, so... And we like to listen, so there's no uh, no problem there. But we will have to maybe do a follow up and dive into maybe specifically vintage, or or we'll pick some subcategory of champagne to get a little deeper into. But uh, for now, to all of our listeners, don't forget to subscribe. Thank you so much for tuning in for another episode. You can follow us at Inventory on Instagram or go to inventory.com to start managing your collection. And Charles, to get your book, I think they can. I just ordered it on Amazon. This book, Vintage Champagne. Uh, you also have a book. Another one. You want to just mention your other book? Sure. The other one is called The Original Grown Crew of Burgundy. And uh, uh, actually, champagne is a passion. Burgundy, I spend much more time writing about. In fact, I've got to get back to my article for Decanter. I'm the Burgundy correspondent for Decanter magazine. And uh, the first book is still selling gratifyingly well. So, you know, they're both available on Amazon. They're treasure troves of information for uh, a very reasonable price. And I think you should read them all. Agree. And then Mapping Champagne, where would anybody find information about that project? You can find that actually also on Amazon or on the website of the, uh, the gentleman who's the cartographer. He's a guy named Steve DeLong. He's actually American, but he's been based in London for 25 years or so. And so DeLongWine.com, he has not only the Mapping Champagne stuff that we've been doing together, but he's been making maps uh, for a long time and has many different uh, maps but uh, the champagne ones are the only ones with charles's commentary so hopefully you'll find some stuff on steve's site that you like as well perfect and we'll link all of those we'll link both your books and the mapping champagne project in uh in the in the uh, thank you so much captions. i appreciate it and thanks for having me it was lots of fun this is always a lot of fun, Charles. We are due to have some champagne together soon, and I'm due to go to champagne. So <laughs> two milestones before our next meet. Sounds good. Cheers. Thank you.